Lastly, just want to share with you today is our Integrate Sunday that we have as a church family from near the beginning of our establishment of the nation's church. Integrate Sunday is the, the Sunday where we celebrate the, on the first Sunday of each month, where we um, have all the children ministries and youth ministries coming together, not doing something separate, but together as a whole church family where we worship and learn from God's word together. And so these Sundays um, are designed to really help engage all ages together, right? So I know that's kind of what's been happening there at home, most likely, but especially here in in in-person services, we really encourage um, adults, all of us uncles and and aunts of, of the faith to come together around our children and teach them. So talking is encouraged. It's supposed to be a little bit noisy, if you will. And so those are things that we love to keep on doing here um, on Integrate Sundays. Communion is also something we celebrate on our Integrate Sunday. So there at home, if you haven't prepared your communion elements, please take time to, to do that, and we'll share in that together after the message this morning. Kids also remember we have a shekel activity that is going to be announced almost like midway through the sermon message today. So stay tuned for that. I think it's going to be a really, really uh, special one for, for us together as a church family as we look into this series on Christ centered homes. And actually the, the, the spirit of integrate, what we demonstrate here on Integrate carries a very important message that intertwines really well with this new series we started last week on Christ-centered homes. And and really what the spirit of Integrate is and what we're looking here at in, in Christ-centered homes is the raising of a multi-generation of faithfulness. Yeah, and, and that is what we believe deeply here at the nation's church, what we are doing our absolute best to obey God in, in raising the generations to come to be faithful followers of Jesus Christ no matter the cost. Uh, and we, that is our responsibility. And, and so in this sermon series, that is what we're addressing and getting it deeper into, not just our church services, but in the homes. Because as we mentioned last week, a Christ-centered church is made up of Christ-centered homes. And today we're going to address a pretty basic question. Why do we have children? That is our question that we're going to be addressing today. And I want to just take a moment and, and, and say this again. I mentioned this last week. This sermon series is, is meant for all of God's people, for every age, for every stage of life, and whatever your marital status be. Um, today, again, we have children joining in the service, and so this is meant for everyone to hear. And so even though it may not be relevant right here, right now, whether you're a single, unmarried, or you're uh, married, you don't have any kids, and, and may be speaking to parents, but this is meant for all of God's people because it has an equipping and discipling purpose to it. And so this is how God equips the church. As, as we learn together what it means to be married according to God, what it means to have children according to Scripture and His revealed Word that He brings to us through His Word. So, hope that encourages you and hope you stay tuned again wherever you are in your stage of life. So, back to the question, why do we have children? Really basic question. Um, the world has a lot of answers to this question. They have a lot of reasons to this question. Um, But my question back to us as disciples of Jesus Christ is, are those the same reasons that we have for having children? I think that's important for us to ask ourselves because, again, in the series, I encourage us, we just need to be honest, right? It's, It's just to be honest because honesty is that fertile ground for God's truth to begin to renew our minds. And what happens when we, God renews our minds? It transforms us. Yeah? Romans 12 tells us that. It transforms us. And, and so there are several reasons, I think, when people are asked, why, why do you have children, that 
are the world's answers, but maybe even our answers. Yeah, when asked this question, some, some have even just said, you know what, I've never even thought about it because we never even purposefully planned to have kids. It just happened. <laughs> we got married and then, surprise, we had children and then the speed of life happened, right? And so we're just learning and going and it's just been busy and the next kid came and the next kid came. And so, yeah, we never even really considered that. It was never even a purposeful choice or plan for us. Or others just saying, well, you know what, it just, we just thought it's just what you're supposed to do. You know, you, you grow up, you get married, and then when you get married, you have kids. That's what you're just supposed to do, right? I think those are pretty common answers. Um, others believe it to be an old age policy, insurance policy, right? Yeah, so as I get older, you want somebody to take care of me. Yeah, we got one over here. Yeah. Yeah. So is that, is that your reason, right? Um, for others, it's maybe a little bit more meaningful in the sense of, I've always just wanted to be a father. I always wanted to be a mother. You know, the experience, that parent-child relationship. Uh, um, uh, others might have said that it's, it's, it's uh, this wonderful physical representation of our love or expression of our love. You know, we always thought it'd be so great to have a little um, kids who look like me running around the house. You know, it's kind of a, a cute answer to that. I've heard some who are just really vulnerable and, and honest say, you know, it's actually because we, we thought it would save the marriage. We thought having children would keep the marriage together. I mean, just say this, that is never a good reason to, to have children because it doesn't work. Um, a, a child doesn't hold the marriage together. Um, some have admitted to being lonely in their marriage, and they would think that having a child, they would be able to love this child and that child would love them back. You know, these, these are reasons that are out there, but are they our reasons as well? That's not God's purpose for why we have children. And I think that's important for us to recognize and, and really, again, evaluate and, and come before the presence of God um, and, and think at whether, whatever age we are, whatever stage of life, especially as parents, that we need to understand what God's purpose for having children are. And, and here's the loving truth of the matter, is that those reasons are actually self-centered reasons. That's the loving truth. They're not Christ-centered reasons. And when we have self-centered reasons for what we do, it's really difficult, if not impossible, actually it is impossible, to build a Christ-centered home. Self-centered purposes get in the way of Christ-centered purposes and foundations. And, and that's, that's the loving truth because whatever our reason for, say, getting married is, will also have a direct impact on how we do marriage, yeah? And, and what holds the marriage together. The reason that we have children is going to have a direct influence, effect, and impact on how we do parenting and why we parent and what's going to happen. And it has a direct impact on our level of engagement, on our level of commitment, on our level of direction, what our direction is. And so, for example, if we're getting married because I want to be happy in life, and I believe this person is going to make me happy, the moment unhappiness arrives, that's going to dictate my level of commitment, my level of engagement, right? M what direction, what the purpose is. If my, if my only reason for having children is because I want to experience the positive um, just the experiences of being a parent and having that parent-child relationship, but the moment when it becomes not enjoyable for me, not convenient and, and not engaging, well, that's also going to affect our reasons of engaging or not engaging, parenting, training, all of those things. It's the difference between a temporal reason and an eternal reason, and God gives us an eternal reason. An eternal reason is not bound by the things of this world. It isn't. And that's what 
the beauty of God's word is in, in bringing life to our hearts and how we can build a foundation of a family and a home that is on Christ, a solid rock. That's where I want to stand. Today, as we sung today, you know, choose to follow Jesus, right? That, that is our choice each and every day. So we're going to take a look at some important points of where we're going to um, understand through Scripture this question of why we have children. And if you're saying to yourself, huh, Pastor, I think though some of those reasons are mine, and I, I, I think I do have self-centered reasons for why I got married or why I have kids, I want to tell you this, you're in the perfect place. You're in the right place. And, and God is, has you exactly where he wants you to be to meet with him. Because he, what he wants to do is impart his loving and life-giving truths to you to show you a better way, his way. And not only that, not only just point you in the right direction, his way, he wants to empower you to go that life-giving way. That will not only bless you, but everyone around you that you love and you cherish. So let's give, um, let's read today's Bible quote in Exodus chapter 20, verse 6. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. We're going to come back to this incredible promise of God here in just a little bit. But I will, first, I want to help us get a fuller picture of God's reasons for why we have kids. And in order to do that, we need to first understand why God has also purposed marriage why he created marriage, and what the purpose of getting mar married is. So let's go into our first point this morning. And here it is. Through marriage, we embody God's image. Through marriage, we embody God's image. And back in Genesis, we read that God um, saying, as he was making humankind, he said, then God said, let us make mankind in our image. In our likeness. From the very beginning of time, we see a revelation of God in his essence being relational. His nature is relational. Yeah? And, and so then he says in Genesis 127, so God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them them together male and female he created them in his image it's beautiful this shows us the the beauty of the triune god being reflected in us as human beings male and female but listen to this this is not simply about two different genders reflecting the the nature of god this is not just the first man and woman that was created. This is the first husband and wife that was created. Yeah? And, and so we need to understand what we're seeing here is not just two genders reflecting the nature of God. It is the man and his wife, husband and wife, in that intimate fellowship and relationship together, embodying the nature, essence, and image of our Creator. Let's read this in, in um, Genesis, Matthew, excuse me, Matthew 19, 4 through 5, where Jesus says, he answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, Therefore a man shall leave his mother, his father and his mother, and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That one flesh leaving your mother and father, cleaving together, holding fast to one another, that is to reflect who God is, our triune God. In fact, Jesus prayed that we not only be simply a reflection of the Trinity, that we are actually the extension of 
the Trinity. He prayed this, that all of them may be one Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, that we be one. It's not like the moon reflecting the sun, that's being who we are. We are actually the very extension of who God is. And marriage has been designed to embody that here on earth to a disbelieving world. That is the reason. That's the purpose of marriage. And I can't go into all the details of it. There's books written on this, but in its essence, that is what marriage is all about. And so Christ-centered homes are made up Oh, excuse me, Christ-centered homes are what makes up a Christ-centered church, right? And in Christ-centered homes, a Christ-centered marriage is so important in building a Christ-centered home. I, I say this with, with incredible sensitivity because I know we have people listening who are, who, who are single parents, yeah? Who are not, not married right now. Who, who may have a spouse that doesn't believe in Jesus, right? Or if you're just being honest and saying, we, you know, not only is my marriage not Christ-centered, it's, it's a bad marriage. Okay, great. Let, let's, let's stay there. But here's the, here's the truth I want to share with you guys. Regardless of your status, regardless of what it is, our kids need to understand this truth, that a Christ-centered marriage is vital in building a Christ-centered home. So regardless of where our passage or where our current circumstances are, our kids need to know this and hear this, yeah? And, and that's where the beauty of the church family comes in because even if we don't have a Christ-centered marriage to expose our kids, we have the opportunity to. And I, I always say this, we need to expose our children to Christ-centered, godly marriages. Make the opportunity so that they can see that and witness. In fact, that has been such a life-changing. I, I can give testimony of, to testimony of how that has blessed me, changed my life. I can tell you the families, the Sapkowskis, the Coles, the Byrons that I was around that I had never seen, but once I entered into their home, heard, saw them interact, it just it was the word in the flesh, <laughs> if you know what I mean. It was the word of God in the flesh that I could see. I remember Mr. and Mrs. Sapkowski telling us stories of how they just love being around each other. They're such good friends. And they said they, they have a hard time keeping their hands off each other. And I thought that was really weird to hear from a Christian couple. And they, they would say that even in bed, they would, they would, their toes would touch because that's just, just how much they just like being close to each other. And I was like, that's kind of corny, but that's kind of cool. Yeah, that's kind of corny, but that's kind of cool, right? But it just, it blessed me. And, and Mr. Byron, he was a pilot. He was just this guy who used me, man's man. When you saw me, this is a man. He'd come home with his pilot uniform on, and you just, he just it oozed important. Wow, this guy has, is important. He has an important job. But I have never met a more humble man. And the way his wife would just delight and just the respect that just exuded from her, it was just memorable, yeah? It's not just the words that, that were said. Or it was just, just being in the home, seeing that marriage blessed me. And it got me to see, wow, this is what a godly marriage looks like. I remember when Mr. Byron got on his knees. I have never saw this before. One, one of his child, children acting up with guests in his home, right? And she, and she was acting up and screaming, having a tantrum. He got on his knees, and he just... He just spoke with her so gently, lovingly, and, and ended that discipline, firm discipline, saying, hey, what did we talk about? What did we talk about? Yep, so when this happens, what happens next? This is what happens next. I love you. Let's go do this. We're going to get through this together. I've never seen that before. Never seen that before. That, that, that connection, right? When, in, in my experience, when things got loud, everyone got loud. <laughs> yeah. there, there is no... You know, loud, hey, calm. It's it just, that is what our kids need to see and experience. 
And so I've got a challenge for us. Maybe it feels like a challenge for you, or maybe it feels like inspiration to you. But I, I want us, in this series, I want to bring out some practical things that we can do, like right here, right now, right? Take this in, because... Um, these are things that if we choose to implement, even in the smallest of ways, I believe they can have the biggest of impacts in our families. One of the things that, um, that really have, make a difference in a Christ-centered home is our schedules. Like, like our budgets and like our finances, you, you, if somebody was able to take a look at your finances, they could tell what is probably important for you as a family or for you as an individual because that's what you spend your money on, Right? Same thing with our, with our schedules. What our routine schedule is in the home which shares an important message to your children of what's important. And I'm not trying to pick on um, education here, but I just know education is really important in this culture, right? And to a lot of families, a lot of people. But if your whole day-to-day -day schedule is education, 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 what are we saying to our kids when we prioritize that as the most important, at least in our schedules, well, we can say Jesus is the most important, but the feeling and the experience is education is actually the most important, right? And so our schedules, our day-to-day -day schedules of what we do in our homes, are they filled with God, right? It doesn't mean that everything needs to be religious. I'll talk about that in a little bit. But it, what does that look like? It, is it communicating the things that we want to communicate, Right? I'll be, like I said, I was trying, I want to be very honest and share with you kind of even where we are as a pastor's family. For, for a, at least for our family, the, the, the thing is, it's like we do ministry 24-7, seems like. And, and so we, can, we have been tempted and it feels like a, 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 a kind of an intentional focus that we have to have to where the home then doesn't feel like, okay, no more ministry. <laughs> that, that is a really hard thing to where now everything has to be non-ministry at home. I believe that is something that, that the devil wants to convince us of, and we have been able to just, yeah, fall in weakness of, but such clarity, no, no. What we want to, that's where our kids are going to learn about what's important, our schedule. So here's my challenge for us, yeah. Just one, if you have not been doing this, if you already do it, keep doing it, but just maybe one Night a week. Have a family fun night. Have a family fun night. If, ne if not one time in a week, maybe one, twice in a month. Do whatever works well with you, okay? Even if it's just twice a month, that's 24 intentional times throughout the year that you're going to be pouring in and training up your children, parents, okay? And, dur and I say fun, and here's the mission. Make it fun. Let's teach our children that God is the source of joy, Let's be creative. Let's, let's have fun. But how do we do this? Well, I, that's where I want to bring some resources for you. There's a family night activity that's um, on the online post for today's sermon note. And it's going to have a video, and it's going to have a PDF that you can go take a look at, and it's going to show you a really cool idea of communicating, teaching your children on a family fun night um, what marriage is, God's purpose for marriage. Yeah? And so take a look at that. See if that's a good resource, and that just kind of fits in what we've been, what we've been talking about. And it's fun. It's, it's a blast. And it involves your kids. And I'm, what I'm hoping is these things will give us some ideas of what that looks like. It doesn't have to just look, okay, everybody sit down, let's read our Bibles, and then pray, and then end. That's good, too, if that's considered fun for you guys, right? But for kids, that may not be as fun it is for us. And so there's ways that we can do that. Yeah. So here on the slide, you can see where that's located. So that's my challenge for you. So through marriage, we embody the image of God, and that's what we want to help um, teach our children. And then second point, through children, we establish generations of faithfulness to God. I want to, I want to share something with you, church family. Um, this sermon series has been birthed from several weeks, months, of conversations that the children and youth ministries and others have been involved in of what God wants for us as we have entered into this new phase as, as a faith family, especially in how he wants us to continue building into our new generation. And, and, and God has really put on our hearts that 
It's not the children that we need to be really focused on. Um, that, that's that's going to continue to be our focus, but it's the parents of those children that we really need to equip. And so, church, what we're doing right now, and pray for us, we're, we're developing ways that we as a church can equip you as families to build Christ-centered homes so that we are a Christ-centered church. And, and this sermon series is really a, a kind of a, um, a readiness, a preparation for that that is to come, that we can come together and have our hearts prepared so that is what we enter into in the fullness of what God has envisioned us with. So through children, we establish generations of faithfulness to God. There is a pa- passage in the book of Malachi, sometimes that used to talk about marriage because it's addressing, God's addressing unfaithfulness in marriage. But even though it's talking about marriage and unfaithfulness, God in this particular passage reveals to us something about parenting, what he truly wants from faithful marriages So the context is this. The Israelites, they're crying out to God. They're asking him why he's not listening to their prayers, why he's not accepting of their worship and their offerings. And he tells them simply it's because they're letting their marriages fall apart. Yeah? And he wants them to be faithful in their marriages. And he tells them why. Here's the why. Malachi 2 15. Didn't the Lord make you one with your wife? In body and spirit, you are his. And what does he want? Godly children from your union. So guard your heart. Remain loyal to the wife of your youth. He's telling them, I want you to be faithful The reason I am not listening to your prayers, not accepting your worship, is because you've been unfaithful. You're letting your marriages fall apart, and I want you to keep your marriages together. I want you to be faithful in your marriages, and here's the reason why. Godly offspring. Godly children. The reason God desires faithfulness in their marriages is because he desires godly children. Throughout the Old Testament, I don't know if you've recognized this, God not, is not only known as, he refers to himself as, which is interesting if you think about it, as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's how he reveals himself as, identifies himself as. Have you ever asked yourself why that is? I believe that in our modern Christian culture, we have swung the pendulum a bit too far in focusing, emphasizing our relationship with God as being only personal. A personal relationship with God, which is important. It's not to say it's not important. That's vital and important. But with that emphasis, we forget what throughout Scripture emphasizes. Actually, our relationship with God, our faith in Him is not simply just personal. It is generational. That our faith that we have in God didn't come out of a vacuum somewhere and it's just me. It came through a long line of believers, of faithful people of generations that come down from the beginning, from Abraham all the way to David, all the way down to the forefathers, down to me. That is really important for us to understand. In fact, that's what the Bible is emphasizing when you read through the genealogies. And of course, the, one of the important highlights is how the Messiah, Jesus Christ, has come through this lineage of faith. But it's also showing us that faith is passed down from generation to generation. And that is the, the mission of God. That's our mission as, as, a, as a family to pass on the faith from generation to generation. To have this mindset. Let's read this in Psalms 78, verse 5 through 6. For he issued his laws to Jacob. He gave his instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children. Verse 6, so the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born. And they in turn will teach their own children. Do you see the reason that God is showing to us why we teach our children? It's not only so that they know God's word and follow God, 
but so that their children who have not been born yet will also be taught God's word and follow God. And they, the, those way not born, will also know God and follow God. That's the mindset that God wants for us as parents and those who he calls into parenthood to be parents one day to have. That my actions now have a multi-generational impact. That it's not just about my children, but it's about those children of my children who have not yet been born yet. This is what God wants to envision us with, of why we have children. All right, kids, I hope you're still listening, tuned in. This is your shekel activity. I think it's a cool activity if you're, if you're willing to hear what God is teaching us right here in this truth. Draw a picture, okay? Or you can use your iPad, you can model it out of clay, you can build it out of Legos, whatever you want. Just, just create a picture of you teaching your future children about an important truth you've learned about God. Something you've learned about God and draw a picture of you teaching your children who have not been born yet, but you doing that. Because that, kids, is the vision he wants you to have even in your age right now. And so when you do that, go ahead and send it to nextgen at the nations dot Asia. And that's our, that's our um, focus, next, our next generation. That's nextgen at the nations dot Asia. It's not a technology emphasis. It's a spiritual emphasis here. <laughs> we, we love taking the things of this world and saying, hey, let's redeem this for Christ's purposes here. Yeah. So the truth principle here is that what we do now as parents actually have an eternal impact on the generations to come. And there's this, there is a really hard-hitting, eye-opening um, passage of Scripture it, that's nestled within Exodus chapter 20, where it lists out the Ten Commandments um, it, there in the Second Commandment, and it highlights this truth. Let's read that together. Starting in verse 4, Exodus 20. Do not make an idol for yourself, whether in the shape of anything in the heavens above or in the earth below or in the waters under the earth. Do not bow in worship to them and do not serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a Jealous God, bringing the consequences of the Father's iniquity, in other words, sin, on the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. Last week, we talked about how Christ-centered homes worship God alone and how important it is for if you want a Christ-centered home, we need to get rid of the idols of our past right, of those previous generations or even of our past of things that we had worshipped, that we have said is this is the most important thing in life. We talked about that and had to make that choice because the thing is what we see here, if we don't do that, that has consequences. That sin of idolatry has consequences to the third and fourth generation. So, let us not be deceived because it's so easy to be deceived. This is one of Satan's biggest lies to us is that your sin only hurts you. That your sin, as long as you keep it within yourselves and nobody else knows, doesn't affect anyone. And if it's going to hurt anyone, it just hurts you. That is not true at all. In fact, it's bigger than that. The power of sin has the impact to the third and fourth generations of our family tree. Wow. Romans 5.12 said, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world, and Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone. And that's what happens. Sin spreads through the family tree. In, in my counseling time, when I meet with families, when we do family counseling together, one thing we do is called a, a genogram. And a genogram is kind of like a family tree that you do for 
counseling purposes. And what you do is you go to several generations before to the current generation and then the kids and you look through and you look at themes of relationship and you look at themes of what's been passed down. And you'll, it's, it's always what you see is if there's alcoholism that starts here, alcoholism goes all the way through. If you see depression here, you see depression going all the way through. If you see infidelity going from here, it goes all the way through, right? You see divorces, you see divorces hitting generation after different generation and generation and generation, right? And we see that in, in scripture as, as well. We see that favoritism goes from line to line to line. Violence and murder going from line to line to line. Sexual immorality going from line to line to line. Sin spreads through the family tree. So let us not be deceived that our sin, the things that we do, only affect us. That's the bad news. Doesn't that feel like bad news? But there's good news. Oh, there's really good news. Let's look at the next verse, Exodus 20. Verse 6, but, oh, but, showing faithful love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. The power of sin, please understand, is great, but God is greater. Sin spreads to the third and fourth generations, but to those who love God and keep his commandments, the blessing of his faithful love impacts a thousand generations. Yeah? Do you hear that? Yes, the power of sin is great, but here's the thing. Your loving obedience to God in the things that he's giving you to do in your home, impacts thousands of generations. That's his unfailing faithful love to those who love him and keep his commands. Oh, that is the good news. Your family tree, yes, it may have been disease and rotting with, with the disease of sin, but God transforms your family tree to the tree of life, his life. And here's the thing. If you're the first Christian in your family, in your family tree, you're the first Christian. Oh, I hope this encourages you because what God wants to do through you and what he will do through you, through your loving obedience of him, is even though there have been generations of the past that have been faithless, and has been diseased and rotting with this, the curse of sin through you, thousands of generations will be impacted by his unfailing love. Praise him. Through marriage, we, are, we embody the God's image. Through children, we establish generations of faithfulness. And lastly, through family, we declare God's message of reconciliation. Oh, this one is good. This one is so good. Through family, we declare God's message of reconciliation. Let's go back to the book of Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament scriptures. Um, Gary Thomas is a author I just really enjoy reading. And as I was reading, preparing for um, this message, he pointed something out, highlighted this, that just really grabbed a hold of my attention. And I just want to share this with you. And he pointed out how the last verse of this last Old Testament book in the book of Malachi speaks to this question that we're being ask, asking, why do we have children? Malachi chapter 4 verse 6. And here's the context. This verse is referring to, it uses Elijah as kind of a, a symbol of the coming messenger, prophet, uh, the forerunner that is to come. And when he comes, this image is being painted for us of something that's going to happen as a New Testament reality. Okay? And, and so the Old Testament ends with this, and it points to the New Testament, and this is what it says in Malachi 4, 6. He will turn the hearts of the fathers back to their children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, so that I will not come and strike the land 
with complete destruction. This is the last verse of the Old Testament. And meaning even though there is a terrible judgment that is to come, so is salvation. And, And salvation, as it comes... When this messenger comes and paves the way for the Messiah, when that comes, one of the symbols, one of the indications, one of the signs of the Messiah to come is a healing of the families, a reconciling of the families, a reunification of the families, of turning the hearts of the fathers back to their children and the children back to their fathers. And it's significant because this being the last verse of Scripture also points to the fact that the beginning of the Old Testament opens up, especially after the fall of man, with family after family after families that are broken and terribly dysfunctional. (laughs) The whole line that you see from the beginning of Genesis all the way to Malachi is a series of broken, disastrous families. Every family being full of dysfunction. Starting with Adam and Eve, of course, blaming each other. And for them, set all of marriages to be in conflict to one another. Then it escalated really quickly from there to where their, their children, one of their children kills their own, their, one of their other children a murder in the very first family, then goes from there when Noah actually curses his youngest son because of his actions. Then you have Abraham who sends off, exiles his son Ishmael with his mother Hagar to basically die. That, that happened in Abraham's family, right? Joseph's brother selling his, him into slavery. I mean, this, is this happening in your family? Do you have this? Do you have murder in your family? Do you have siblings selling another sibling into slavery in your family? I mean, this is, this is as, as bad as it comes. Jacob and Esau fighting over the firstborn blessing, right? And, of course, David's family, the David, who's known as the man after God's own heart. Do you know his family was as dysfunctional as it comes? One of his sons does a horrific act to one of his daughters, Right? And so his other son, Absalom, in revenge, kills David's son. And that son, Absalom, later rebels against David to, and wants to take over David's throne. He sets off to kill his own father. <sighs> this goes to show us that religion doesn't keep families together. These families knew God. But based off the law, The law cannot keep our families together. Jesus keeps our families together. Our centering around Christ is not a religious act. It's what brings life into our families. It brings reconciliation to our families. And this, we've been talking about how marriages embodies the image of God. Well, what another picture of what families is, as we see in Malachi, is this is our least families. God is intending through families that we are these little images, these pictures of the gospel of Jesus Christ, of the message of reconciliation that God has given to us to show the world that, the, that this is what happens. One of the first manifestations of salvation is the reconciliation of Fathers to their sons and their children. Parents to their children's hearts. That is what a Christ-centered home is really about. Is that we embody the very nature of the gospel to a disbelieving world. That's the purpose that God has for us of why we have children. Isn't that true though? It's without God's forgiveness, his grace, his love, with that embodying us, how, do we, how does that happen with our own children? In fact, what the Old Testament shows us is it cannot happen. But Malachi ends with this beautiful promise. When the Messiah comes, he's going to turn back the hearts of the fathers to the children and those children back to the father. 
2 Corinthians 5.18 tells us that everything is from God and who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. And Christ-centered families become the proof of this message to the world. It's not just a symbol. We are the proof. And that's so, that's why it's so important that we have a Christ-centered home because it becomes the word of God in the flesh to this world of this message of reconciliation that God has accomplished through Jesus Christ, his work on the cross that he died for you, for your sins. He took the wrath of God that was deserved for you upon himself so that you may be saved. To reconcile you back to God because sin separated you from him forever. And there is no other way. And not only God provided a way, he provided the way, the best way. That is God for you. He doesn't give you a series of choices saying, "Eh, option C is not as good as option B. Option A is the best choice. So I just wanted to give you many different choices so you can give no. That is not the character of God. When he makes a way, he gives you the best way. And it's the only way because it's the best way. And through the family, we have be able to manifest God's redemptive plan and purpose for all of humanity. That is why we have children. Is that clear? Is that a clear answer to the question for us this morning of understanding why we have children? The vision for every Christian parent and every Christian who is called to be a parent or a spiritual uncle or a spiritual aunt, grandmother in the family of God. Our purpose as parents is not about us. Those self-centered purposes and reasons, it can't, it can't continue. Because God's purpose for why we are parents is all about him. It's all about Jesus. It's about him and that him alone and what he's done. That is what helps us when our teenagers become rebellious and our parenting becomes no longer enjoyable or when our daughters didn't completely finish dressing up and are about to head out the door that we don't avoid it and we talk with them and we engage them. And our reason for not engaging is simply not because I just, oh, I know where this goes. This is inconvenient for me. I'm going to have to go to work. I don't have time for this. It's not that, but my, I, this vision of God has for a family is a, for generations and generations. So when we train and we teach, it is about this vision that God has for us, that we are a family that is to show the redeeming plan of salvation, the gospel to those around us. It's eternal. This is the reason that God has. And so when we are in a bad place in our marriage, we saw that to love my wife is not about me and getting love back. It is to demonstrate Jesus' love for me and that he died for me. That's how I'm supposed to love my wife. And I do it for that reason. That is why we do it. We embody who God is. Yeah? This is the only way that we have marriages and, and parents and families and homes that are eternal in their influence and impact in this world. And not only that, upon generations, upon generations. So let's celebrate Jesus, yeah? Let's celebrate Jesus. That's what we're going to do right now. And, and celebrating what he has done on the cross. And we're going to conclude today with, uh, on our message with the sharing of communion, um, as we do every first Sunday on Integrate Service each month. And so communion also called the Lord's Supper. This is for those of us who have given our lives to Jesus Christ because we want him to be our Lord and we know him to be our Savior. And so if that is you, please join with us in taking communion in this time. So go ahead and prepare your elements. Take out your bread. Take out your Um, juice, grape juice works perfect here. And I'm just going to 
give just a second for us to do that. I've got to open up mine up here. I'm going to just put my mic down and do that. Let's get ready. I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And let's hold together the bread in our hands. Let's not take it just right now. Let's take it together. I'll read this verse. Um, and then we'll break the bread and we'll take it together. We'll pray. And then we'll also take the cup together as a, as a whole family. Verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I was I also passed on to you. On the night when he was betrayed... The Lord took, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's break the bread. Let's take it together. the cup in our hands. In the same way, he took the cup after supper and said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's what we're doing, church. We're proclaiming the victory of the Lord's death what he has done, the finished work of the cross, and what that has meant for us, what has meant for this world, and we're proclaiming it until Jesus comes again. Let's take the cup together. Jesus, we are so thankful that you have given to us this wonderful command and opportunity to take this bread and to take the fruit of the vine together in remembrance of you. Father, I, I pray right now, I just simply think in my heart that Lord, you've given us, as we're talking about Christ-centered homes and how to build who you are and the message of Christ and, and all that you've done for us in the home, I, I pray that we will consider taking communion in our homes. Um, Father, inspire us with ideas of how we can start to take what you've taught us throughout the years and, and bring them, entrench them, integrate them into our schedules and our homes. Because what, Father, you've shown us here is that, Lord, it is the finished work of the, Christ, of the cross that is through Jesus Christ is what we owe our life to. It is why we are here today in worship of you. That worship overflows of our hearts because, Lord, you've saved us. You've saved us. You died for us and your blood has, has washed away all of our sins. And you removed our sins from as far as the, the east is from the west. And they're removed from you completely. It's not just an erasing of, of the past. That This is a complete work that affects not only our past, but our present and our future. That our life right now is in you. We have eternal life because of what you have done for us. And we celebrate you, and we praise you, and we thank you, Lord Jesus. And we remember you. And God, as you've spoken to us through your word today, Holy Spirit, bring into our mind that is the mind of Christ. Ways that, Lord, you can help us be centering our whole lives, our homes, our household on our Lord Jesus. 
Honor him, glorify him, most importantly, raise generations of faithfulness to you. Bless your holy name. In Jesus, we pray. Amen.